I want to say that this presentation is largely based on my, my plenary talk at Learner Purpose Research 2019. Um, so if you already heard me there, maybe you don't want to lose your time too much today. There will be a few things new, but not too much. I'm afraid I've been busy with uh, other uh, things last year. Um, so this is just uh, words of caution about the talk, okay? Um, linguistic complexity is commonly defined as the range of forms that surface in language production and the degree of sophistication of such forms. And it's one of the major research variables in applied linguistics research. It's widely used to describe L2 performance, assess L2 proficiency, and trace L2 development. Um, admittedly, the scope of linguistic complexity is no longer na narrowed down to syntactic complexity as it used to be. Um, in, linguist in applied linguistics today, there is a basic distinction between lexical complexity and grammatical complexity. Um, when lexical complexity invest is investigated, however, it is often only analyzed by means of single word based measures, such as type token ratio uh, formulas and frequency word lists. Notable exceptions are to be found in recent studies based on the tool for automatic analysis of lexical sophistication uh, developed by Christopher Kyle and Scott Crossley, which includes uh, n-gram frequencies, uh, n-gram proportions, and association strength. Um, I think it's fair enough, though, to say that in L2 research so far, there hasn't been any systematic attempt to theorize, uh, theorize, sorry, operationalize the construct of linguistic complexity at the level of either word combinations or the Lexis grammar interface. Um, the need for measures of complexity that account for how words uh, naturally combine to form conventional patterns of meaning and use uh, is particularly evident from this set of examples. Uh, it's a set of examples I've used in several conferences so far, but I think it's, it's really a good, a good set of examples, so I, I'll keep using it for a while. If these sentences were analyzed together, uh, the 10 instances of the verb meet would be considered as repetitions of a single form, which would contribute to lowering the lexical range and diversity of this set of sentences. In terms of lexical sophistication, all instances of the verb meet would be regarded as occurrences of the same high frequency verb, despite as much varied patterns of use from restricted collocations such as meets plus meets or meets plus expectations or target, figurative idioms such as meet your Waterloo, and speech formulae such as nice to meet you. At the syntactic level, no measure would do justice either to the variety of syntactic uh, constructions in which the verb meet is to be uh, found. Verb plus object, verb plus particle, non-finite complement in a causative structure, head of a two infinitive structure, and so forth. So what these examples clearly show um, is that traditional measures of complexity uh, cannot account for all the complexity of language use. Most particularly, uh, they cannot account for the way words combine in a meaningful way. There is also a need to bridge the gap between L2 complexity research and other disciplines where uh, word combinations have been at the forefront of scientific inquiry for the last few decades. Studies in corpus linguistics, psycholinguistics, and cognitive linguistics have demonstrated repeatedly that word combinations, and you may call them, you may, they may be framed in terms of phraseological units, um, uh, formulaic sequences, collocations, constructions, or collostructions. Well, these word combinations play crucial roles in language acquisition, processing, fluency, idiomaticity, and change. There is also an extended body of literature on phraseology in L2 vocabulary research that would arguably need to be better integrated in L2 complexity uh, studies. 
over the last few years, I've started to working on the construct of phraseological complexity with the aim to theoretically and empirically demonstrate um, its relevance for second language theory in general and L2 complexity research in particular. So far, uh, to delimit the scope of the phraseological phenomena of interest, I've relied on Greece 2008's definition of a phraseologism, which is uh, the co-occurrence of a form or a lemma of a lexical item in any other kind of linguistic element, uh, which can be, for example, uh, another form of a lexical item. Um, or a grammatical pattern as opposed to say a grammatical relation. So when a particular lexical item tends to occur or in or co-occur with a particular grammatical construction. So Gray's definition is interesting in that it includes both word combinations and co-occurrence phenomena at the Lexis grammar interface. Um, when you are interested in the construct of phraseological complexity, well, you want to look at how to um, operationalize uh, the constructs and what type of dimensions are to be described. So diversity and sophistication have also been postulated as two key dimensions of phraseological complexity. While existing studies on the use of phraseological units uh, by L2 learners have not explicitly considered this two-way distinction, it can nonetheless be applied in a relatively straightforward fashion to the measurement of phraseological complexity. Um, a learner text, um, and I'm here, um, a learner text with a wide range of target-like phraseological units uh, and a high proportion of relatively unusual units will be said to be more complex than one where uh, the same few basic word combinations are often repeated. Um, thus, phraseological complexity is defined as the range of phraseological units that surface in language production and the degree of sophistication of such forms. Um, so in terms of um, the corpora I've been using so far to investigate phraseological complexity, um, I've um, focused primarily on L2 English, and I've investigated phraseological complexity in subparts of the following corpora. So the VESPA, uh, which is a corpus um, I compiled, it's a corpus, it's a cross-sectional corpus, of term papers in linguistics by um, a variety of EFL learners, but the subpart I've used uh, is by French EFL learners. The Longdale, which is a, a longitudinal corpus of argumentative essays, same thing, you'll find a variety of uh, L1 backgrounds, but I focused on uh, the subpart that um, was written by French EFL learners. And lastly, the Trinity Lancaster Spoken Learner Corpus, which is a cross-sectional corpus of exam transcripts uh, from learners with a variety of L1 backgrounds. Um, I've also only focused on relational collocations so far to um, operationalize uh, phraseological complexity. Uh, and by relational collocations, I mean uh, collocations in specific grammatical structures such as adjective modifiers, so an adjective plus a noun, uh, or an adverbial modifier patent. And you have, uh, on the slide, you have three examples of adverbial modifiers, either in the form of an adverb uh, modifying an adjective, an adverb modifying an adverb, or an adverb modifying a verb. And lastly, uh, a verb noun, a direct object relationship. Um, so far, I've also only used um, roots type token ratio to operationalize phraseological diversity. Uh, and to operationalize phraseological sophistication, I used two different approaches. The first one uh, is the use of uh, a list of sophisticated collocations uh, defined as academic collocations as they are 
to be found in the academic collocation list. Um, and second, uh, by means of um, pointwise mutual information scores computed on the basis of a variety of reference corpora. Uh, importantly, uh, this slide is just to make sure uh, we understand the procedure. Um, when I'm using uh, MI scores to operationalize phraseological sophistication, I'm basically uh, using MI scores as computed from uh, a reference corpus, and I use these MI scores to describe collocations as they are, as they are found in the learner corpus. Okay. So that's an important methodological point. Obviously, uh, if I'm using a reference corpus to operationalize phraseological sophistication, um, the method is dependent on the, um, the reference corpus that is being used. And this slide is just to show you that depending on the learner corpus I have investigated, well, I've been using different reference corpora uh, which I thought uh, better approximated the type of language that could be expected from the learners. So when I'm working on the VESPA corpus, which is a corpus of research papers and linguistics, I'm using a reference corpus of uh, scientific articles published in uh, applied, applied linguistic journals um, as a reference corpus. When I'm, look, when I'm investigating um, or analyzing the Longdale corpus or the Trinity Lancaster, Lancaster Spoken Learner corpus, I'm using a huge uh, web corpus as a reference corpus for lack of a better uh, reference corpus for argumentative essays on the one hand and um, spoken learner language on the other, okay? Um, in terms of corpus processing, um, computing phraseological complexity measures uh, require heavy uh, corpus processing. I'm not going to provide too much details here because I think it's a bit complex and it would just take me too much time. Um, but if you are interested, you can check my most recent publications on the topic where the method is described in, in um, extensive uh, details. For now, uh, suffice it to say that both the reference corpus and the learner corpus uh, need to be lemmatized, part of speech tagged, uh, and parsed. And when this is done, uh, relational collocations are extracted in the form of dependencies, which serve as the basis to extract relational collocations, their frequencies, and MI scores. So in what follows, what I want to do is to give you a select overview of key findings based on my recent publications. And you'll find, you'll see a, a, a couple of, a, I mean, a few pictures there. These are pictures of my um, uh, collaborators on, on, on this research program. Uh, you'll find Hubert Niles uh, from my university. Um, um, Vaclav Brezina and Dana Glavasova from Lancaster and Stefan Grace. Um, okay, so in my first study on phraseological complexity, I explored the French L1 component of the varieties of uh, English for specific purposes database. Um, as mentioned earlier, this corpus is cross-sectional in that it represents L2 learner language at three proficiency levels from B2 to C2. Um, results showed that measures of phraseological diversity in the form of root type token ratios uh, do not distinguish between proficiency levels in the VESPA corpus. By contrast, measures of phraseological sophistication behave differently across the three proficiency levels. Measures based on the academic collocation list increase linearly from B2 to C2, but differences were um, not significant. By contrast, measures based on mean MI scores uh, were found to discriminate between levels in various ways. 
just to provide um, an example, uh, relational collocations in the form of verb plus noun, um, um, verb plus nominal direct objects are the only relations that discriminate significantly between the C1 and the C2 text, which is aligned with results from previous studies that have shown, shown that verb plus object uh, collocations are particularly difficult to master even at the more advanced uh, proficiency levels. In addition, uh, as an independent variable, uh, mean and my uh, scores for verb plus nominal direct objects are the best predictor of human uh, rating. And when looking at the Longdale corpus, um, mean and my scores were also found to increase significantly with Oxford Quick Placement test scores. To illustrate, uh, this table provides a list of the 20 top ranked um, verb as direct object relations dependencies by decreasing a my score in two learner texts from the Vespa corpus. On the left, you'll find the learner text with the minimum average uh, MI score. And on the right, there is the learner text with the maximum MI, uh, mean MI score. The text on the left was ranked at B2 by two human raters. The text on the right was ranked at C2. Word combinations in the text on the right stand out as being um, perfect native-like restricted collocations typical of academic writing that allow writers to express their meanings in a precise and sophisticated manner so you'll find pursue a career, place emphasis, paint a picture, uh, play a role, um, do justice, adopt a stance, okay? Top ranked uh, dependencies in the B2 text on the left are fine, but as their MI scores um, quickly become lower, they also quickly become less idiomatic, less precise, Okay, so you'll find examples such as distinguished plus kind. Uh, they're also less genre appropriate. Pick your terms, say words. It should also be noted that only six of these relations in, the te in this text are above the MI threshold of three that is often used in the literature to separate out statistical collocations from free combinations. Okay, um, in a corpus of upper intermediate to advanced learner writings such as the VESPA, measures of phraseological complexity were also found to be the only measures of complexity that could discriminate between proficiency levels. So measures of syntactic complexity did not distinguish uh, across levels, only mean length of clause and complex nominals per clause increased linearly from B2 to C2, but the difference um, was not significant. Similarly, we get, I mean, we get the same picture when we look at measures of lexical diversity with only the root type token ratio in corrected um, uh, VV1 displaying a systematic linear increase, but again, the differences are not significant. Um, and when you look at uh, measures of lexical sophistication, well, there was not a single measure of, of lexical sophistication that showed a uh, linear increase in the data set. The study um, also provided preliminary evidence for convergence uh, validity and discriminant validity. Uh, of the construct of phraseological complexity by, demonstrated, by demonstrating sorry, that a limited set of theoretically uh, similar um, measures of phraseo phraseological complexity were related to each other, but of, were very different from traditional measures of lexical complexity. So just to give you an example, this correlation matrix shows very clearly that the three measures of phraseological sophistication based on MI scores 
correlate more with each other than with any measure of lexical sophistication, a construct that could arguably be regarded as quite similar. So exploring the development of phraseological complexity in the Longdale corpus taught us a number of um, important lessons. So the Longdale is a longitudinal corpus with two important characteristics. First, all uh, learner texts are essays written in response to uh, in response to eight topics only, with students answering the same topic at year one and year three. Second, the corpus comes with rich metadata, including Oxford Quick Placement test scores for each student at each data collection point. Um, so one of the main findings uh, in, in the study is that is the significant effect of the prompt on the mean MI scores with essays on violence and lying featuring a higher mean um, MI value than the other essays. And the effects of topic are actually way more subtle than just the typical reuse of word combinations primed by the prompt as often documented in the literature. From the examples on this slide, uh, you can see that the lying prompt, so the prompt being lying as immoral and should always be condemned, well, this prompt uh, seems to mobilize uh, a wide range of semantic domains and less frequent words, uh, loan, lie, um, truth, goal, murder, secret, trouble, which can be explained by the variety of lying examples and anecdotes that are found in such essays. By contrast, uh, it seems that to answer the money prompt, EFL learners only need to mobilize a limited set of related semantic domains that are made up of highly frequent words, frequently used nouns such as uh, money, food, family, job, time, war, house, uh, and verbs such as have, buy, use, give, uh, all these verbs being a part of the 400 most frequent words in the corpus of contemporary American English, for example. Second, um, learner proficiency as assessed by a standardized test, so in our case, the Oxford Quick Placement Test, is a better predictor of phraseological complexity in each learner writing sample than uh, the actual time when the essay was written and uh, Cepher scores. Uh, one important implication is that we need longitudinal corpora that come with proficiency info at each data point to be used as a control variable. Why? Um, because uh, not, well, there are two main reasons. First, not all learners start with the same proficiency at year one, so the first year of the bachelor program in English language and literature for our students, as represented in the long day. So quite the contrary. Learners at bachelor one, they, they range from A2 to C2 on the, on the CEPHER level. Second, um, the foreign language proficiency of each learner develops at a different pace. So this table illustrates the variety of individual trajectories in the Longdale. Here, I'm using CEPHA levels again, instead of the Oxford Quick Placement Test results, just for the ease of uh, interpretability. Our results um, thus suggest that the time spent learning English will not have an effect on phraseological sophistication development per se. So what matters more is foreign language proficiency and whether learners improve from one year to the next. If the general foreign language proficiency of a learner does not improve from one data point collection to the next, uh, there is no reason um, to expect more phraseological complexity in their written productions. So this makes it all the more important to investigate the role of proficiency versus uh, longitudinal development in the Longdale uh, corpus. 
Now, um, the fact that OC OQPT scores get selected in the final model instead of the Cepher predictor is interesting, but perhaps not particularly surprising. Um, since its publication in 2001, the Cepher has become the most widespread reference tool in French language education and assessment across Europe. And learner corpus researchers have consequently seen a range of advantages in using a proficiency scale that is familiar to teachers, raters, and researchers alike. The use of well-defined proficiency categories also offers many advantages in second language research, including ease of interpretation and enhanced comparability across studies. However, from a methodological or statistical perspective, and this is perhaps not surprising to you, our final model shows that the numeric predictor um, OQPT is more informative than its derived categorical predictor, uh, Cepher. It explains more variance in EFL learners' use of statistically assessed um, uh, verb plus direct object dependencies in the long tail. Our results um, thus support Ortega's 2012 call for more study designs where proficiency is treated as a numeric variable and not as a categorical variable as has most often been the, uh, done in our field. Um, more recently, we have also started exploring phraseological complexity in spoken learner language, more particularly in the Trinity Lancaster spoken learner corpus. Um, so we've explored phraseological complexity across exam transcripts, um, we only looked at two tasks, discussion and conversation, and we only looked at four L1 backgrounds, so Chinese learners, uh, learners who have a variety of Indian languages, Italian learners, and Spanish uh, learners. To my surprise, uh, results showed that median MI scores decreased with higher proficiency level in the Trinity Lancaster um, spoken learner corpus. Exploring the data set showed that the difference in collocation use across proficiency levels did not lie in differences in minimum or maximum MI scores or percentages of co-occurrences with lower, higher uh, values, no. What, what happened there, it seemed, was that the major difference across the proficiency levels was in the percentage of negative uh, MI scores with the more advanced learners using more collocations that come with a somewhat high um, negative MI score. Um, these are just a few examples for you. Um, so I'll let you read them. But what is very clear from these examples is that in the spoken data sets, um, so the Trinity Lanc uh, Lancaster Learner Corpus, learners try more at higher proficiency levels. The lower level students, by contrast, keep repeating the same high frequency collocations, so easy stuff, over and over again. While a B1 learner would typically repeat three collocations out of 10, as shown on this table, the C a C2 learner will typically only repeat one collocation in, the tran in its transcript. So this seems to echo particularly well uh, Jones et al. 2018 statement that in oral exams, to be successful at higher levels, a wider range of types must be evidenced. It also points to the need to explore collocation types instead of collocation tokens. Zooming, on, um, zooming in on the C2 level, for example, we find some more sophisticated collocations with other verbs that, than the very frequent uh, verbs such as have. We find more precise vocabulary and some figurative expression, expressions too. 
So interestingly, if we look at the summary statistics for C1 versus C2, um, we also see that it is the very first time when PMI values increase, thus here perhaps representing what I have described elsewhere as phraseological sophistication. At the same level, however, we also find more infelicitous attempts, such as raise a strike or reduce an attitude or do confusion. Um, so here are a few examples. So um, the conclusion here is that phraseological development is slower uh, in, in spoken language. Okay, so time for a few uh, concluding remarks. Um, the studies I reported on today demonstrate very clearly that phraseological complexity and perhaps phraseological sophistication even more so is an essential dimension of L2 proficiency um, and development and as such, uh, I believe it is a useful construct for SLA theory in general and interlanguage complexity research in particular. Um, there is scope in interlanguage research, if not a need for the construct of phraseological complexity, which taps into other linguistic phenomena then currently investigated with the toolbox of syntactic and lexical complexity research. In, two, in 2012, uh, Bülte and Hausen wrote an article on um, defining and operationalizing L2 complexity in which they included somewhat programmatically collocational complexity under the construct of lexical complexity, noting that it had never been measured at all. While it may be a bit too early days to make a strong case for where to situate the construct of phraseological complexity on this tax taxonomy, uh, we definitely need more empirical research into convergent and, and discriminant validity of the construct. The fact that we're working with a broad definition of phraseology that also includes phenomena at the Lexis Grammar interface will probably lead us to argue for a different representation um, where phraseological complexity is on a par with lexical complexity on the one hand and syntactic complexity on the other. It is also, um, an, I mean, the, the construct of phraseological complexity is also an important construct for language teaching, learning, and assessment. And I have argued in a recent paper that it should feature more prominently in the common European framework of references for languages. By placing special emphasis on the productive use of idiomatic expressions at the C2 level, but not referring to the large variety of frequency-based word combinations, the Sefer scales um, promote a very traditional understanding of phraseology. The term phrase um, appears in the scales, but it is only used to refer to stock or memorized pragmatic phrases that especially A1 and A2 learners are able to use thereby uh, confining mastery of recurrent word sequences to the lower proficiency levels and not recognizing the crucial role it plays in advanced language uh, development. More generally, um, the CEF adopts um, a dichotomous view of grammatical and lexical complexity, while in fact, uh, as I've shown you, uh, the two linguistic competences are often intertwined especially at the advanced level. So the construct of phraseological complexity is particularly interesting in that unlike traditional measures of lexical and syntactic complexity, it also proved to be a relatively good discriminator between C1 and C2, um, two levels that have uh, traditionally been particularly difficult to define 
uh, in terms of purely linguistic rather than educational or cognitive developmental. Um, um, I mean, the, the, it, yeah, sorry. So they have been defined in terms of um, educational or cognitive de development criteria. And here I'm, I'm suggesting that it's possible to uh, define and describe these uh, levels with linguistic uh, criteria. So um, the research presented here, uh, well, set the scene for an ambitious research program that is going to keep me and my collaborators busy for the coming years. Um, these are just a few research avenues that I identify as priorities. Um, first, phraseological complexity. So far, I've only approached phraseological complexity via relational collocations. So phraseological complexity could be approached from the prism of other types of word combinations, um, including lexical bundles, P frames, color structures. Second, other measures of phraseological complexity should be developed and empirically validated. Again, so far, I have only used relatively crude measures of phraseological diversity and other indices should be tested in future research. More particularly, recent development in lexical diversity research has provided the field with more sophisticated measures that are not transformations of uh, type token ratios and could be twisted uh, to take into account the properties of word combinations and compute their diversity in learner language. The same holds uh, true for phraseological sophistication where other association measures could be tested as well as measures that unlike means would be able to account for interspeaker uh, variability and different um, reference corpora uh, should be um, should also be used in the sense that using different reference corpora may reveal different aspects of phraseological competence in learner writing. Third, um, other types of learner production should also be analyzed to determine how phraseological complexity interacts with foreign language proficiency and development across modes, tasks, and genres. So we've started doing that. We've been exploring uh, phraseological complexity in um, spoken and written data, uh, in argumentative essays versus term papers, but there is much more that can be done. Um, we also need to work more on um, establishing convergent validity and discrimin discriminant validity of these measures. So just as a reminder, convergent validity is, uh, means whether the battery of phraseological measures in, envisage relates to each other and produce, conver uh, and produce convergent uh, measures, while discriminant validity is about whether or not the construct is different from the constructs, from similar constructs such as um, lexical complexity. And finally, uh, the range of uh, envisaged measures of phraseological complexity, uh, well, they are not language specific per se, and we would like to explore whether the measures could be used to go to proficiency and trace language development in other foreign languages such as L2 Dutch and L2 French. And this is a particularly a promising avenue for research that we have started to explore with two uh, of my PhD students. So investigating phraseological complexity across L2 languages will make it possible to appraise the role of complexification vis-a-vis cross-linguistic inference in foreign language development. And indeed, um, first results um, are sh have shown that I've shown the importance of phraseological complexity development in morphologically richer languages such as French and Dutch. Um, but we also see that in these languages, uh, we need measures of syntactic complexity and morphological uh, complexity uh, more to describe the more advanced levels. Um, in, in, in the corpora that my PhD students, so Rachel Robin and Nathan van der Weert, have investigated. 
And I'm gonna stop here so that we'll have uh, time for 